Hey, hi, hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess. I apologize for my voice. I am sick and that's why I am using my microphone, which I usually don't use with this camera. This is my second time recording this video because the last one didn't have sound. So I'm obviously here to talk about my wrap up uh, for March and hopefully I can remember what I said yesterday because I felt like I said I feel like I explained my books really well yesterday for the first time usually like I'm like mm, what the hell am I saying and of course yesterday I was like oh, okay let look at us explaining our thoughts and then no sound so anyway I hope my voice isn't too bothersome to you if it is I'm, I do apologize but yeah, um, life slump still kicking my butt. Um, and that includes a reading slump. Haven't read, read as much. And um, when I have read, I've read more nonfiction in March than fiction, which is rare. Actually, that just never happens. <sighs> so let's get into it. Um, well, that'd be helpful if I knew what I read. And of course, <laughs> I can't find. So I have tall a tall tripod. But then I also have like a short tripod that I usually put my camera on. Um, well, it depends on the surface. And I can't find it. So you're on top of my water bottle. Which probably isn't a good idea. It's it's dirty as long as I don't hit the table. But then if I get thirsty, I don't have any water. Okay. I didn't say I made good decisions. I just make decisions. Let me pull up my Goodreads here. I read, I had a really good reading month in February and then my, my brain was like, <laughs> that's over. Anywho, I started out the month with the third book in the Expanse series and that is Abaddon's Gate. So this is by James S.A. Corey and um, this has been my least favorite thus far. This one, without spoiling, there are, so in this series, there there's Earth, there's Mars, they don't really get along, there's an outer planet alliance, like there's just different groups of people. And in this book, these different groups are all heading towards this one place in space. And so you get different perspectives from people on these various ships, which at first was fine. Um, but then I started to realize how much we weren't getting of the main characters from the Rocinante, which is the main ship that we follow in the first two books. And that's the crew that I know and love. And that's where Amos is. And so I was like, mm, don't appreciate this lack of Amos. And there is a, so there's a documentary crew on the Rossi, which I do not like them. And then on the, uh, the other POVs, one, we're following this person who is on this revenge mission, which I did not approve of. And this other woman who is like a minister. So she's all about, you know, God. And I was like, no, I don't want it. And uh, this other guy. And it, so like at first, you know, I'm fine with other POVs, but I was like, I don't care about them anymore. And so... I was enjoying the first half and the second half to me was getting really tedious um, and I don't like how things turned out and even so I finished the third book and I was going to watch where the show um, so basically the third book in the show and I haven't even been able to watch much because I'm so mad at what happened in the book and so essentially things of course happen that I don't like people lived that I don't like lived because of favors and, and odd coincidences and happenstance and I'm pissed about it and um, I don't so yesterday when I was recording this, I was talking about this weird place where I am with uh, religion, faith, whatever. I've been consuming a lot of content about people leaving the church, um, you know, deconstructing um, because I consider myself at best a, uh, I consider myself Christian adjacent. Um, but it just, it, the more I learn, just, it's just breaking down all of this mess that was like put in my head anyway. Uh, so I'm just at this weird place. And so hearing, what's her name? I don't even remember the minister. I was like, shut up, shut up. We're in a space opera. And obviously people can have their gods or whatever. But she just was like, oh, I didn't care, girl. I don't care. And her and 
let's have compassion for this person. And like, no, they should die because they did terrible things. And it was really pissing me off. Like, it was really making me mad. And I don't want to watch it in the show. And I don't like how this book ended. And I'm just so mad. I'm very angry. So, I mean, I gave it three stars because I said I did enjoy the first half. And still, my crew, I got some glimpses of them. And some things were cool to learn about. But I just wish we were focused on the things in space. And this one was really just focused on the people and not the people I cared about. If that makes sense. So I'm going to continue, but I'm mad. I'm very mad, and I hope the next one is better. Then I read A Romance, and it was Devon and Chris Plan a Wedding by Shinsia C. Higgins. And I saw this mentioned um, a bunch on Twitter, and I really loved it. And um, I did give it four stars. So we have Chris, who is Black and Latinx. She is a lesbian, she is out to her family, and she is more, um, I don't know the right term, um, stud, more mask presenting, um, you know, dresses more masculine, I think uh, Chris has dreads, and then there is Devon, who's a black woman, she's very curvy, very feminine, you know, very girly, beautiful, and she is also a lesbian, but is not out to her family, and the setup for this book is they both signed up for this reality show, which I'm not going to explain well, because I didn't truly understand it until I was reading further into the book, but a terrible explanation of the reality show is you basically go on here and you get paired with someone random that you haven't met and you have to convince your family members like both sides of your family that you're getting married and the family has to be like involved in helping you plan the wedding and like so you have to be really convincing essentially and they're paired together and Devon's main thing for doing the show besides you know the potential to win money was to help her come out to her mom I think she was already out to her siblings um and then I think Chris I forgot Chris's reason I think Chris was like hey I could find love so anyway obviously it's a romance and love ensues but what I really liked about it was all every time there's a dual perspective in a romance I think that's really great because I love getting both people's POVs Chris's family was hilarious and and heartwarming and lovely and I loved um seeing that support that she got because I don't think you don't always get stories with queer characters where their family is just like a hundred percent accepting and her family was and I loved it and there were other queer members in her family and everyone's just out and loud and funny and loving and snarky and I it was great and how Chris's family uh accepted Devon and treated her and um I just loved those chapters they just were really made me so happy and then Chris or Devon coming out to her mom that was a lot and I was like whoo because her mom is religious and you know she doesn't want to be like you know uh, disowned so a lot of emotions there and just like the banter between Chris and Devon and just the like friends and family members it was just it felt really authentic and real like they felt like real people that I you know could meet in real life and know and um I will say I don't know if I, I don't know how, like, the basis of the reality show is, I think, a good setup, but I don't know if, I don't know if I still fully understand, like, how that premise would work, like, if this was in real life, but I just went with it, obviously, because it's a romance, and I just, I don't have many complaints about it, it just was really good, it was really enjoyable, and, um, I think you should read it. I think you should give it a try. (laughs) See, I'm thirsty, but my water is under the camera. I'm sorry my face is this close. Usually my face is not this close, but I'm trying to be in my microphone, and my microphone has to be connected to the camera, and the cord isn't super long. So 
side note, I, like I said, I don't ever, I usually don't use this camera be, or use this microphone because the camera has a good internal mic, but in, I'm downstairs, so it's more open and I can't really be loud right now. So I just want, so I just wanted to be, you know, able to speak at this volume. So I use my mic, but I was like, oh, hold on. How do I connect it? And so of course I had to Google and it was like, you need this. And it was like, I don't know if I have that random cord, but I texted Andrew and I was like, look at this. This one time being married to a man comes in handy. He's just got a freaking box under the TV, like under the entertainment stand thing, full of cords. And of course I find the perfect cord in there. I'm like, this is great. <laughs> I it was, it was perfect. Um I'm always like, what are what are these here for? And look, it had what I needed. Anywho, the next book I read, I thought when I picked it up, when I read it, when I finished it, I thought it was a nonfiction. Apparently it's not. <laughs> it is apparently fiction. And that is The Secret Lives of Church Ladies by Disha Filia. So this is like short stories. It's it's really short overall. It's 179 pages. I listened to the audiobook on script. And it just really is like a collection of short stories. Like it just starts with one person, you know, telling you their secret and whatever. And then the next story. Um, and so there's a variety of stories from a woman, black woman, whose mother is in, I don't know if it's in hospice care or just like a, um, you know, senior living community, or I think it might be something like hospice care. And, you know, she's there every day. She's going through this hard time and she meets this man who is a white dude and he's married, but he's also going through the same thing and he's there alone and they form this relationship and then this sexual relationship. And then there's also, um, a story, um, about these sisters after their dad passes away and they find out like they had another sister that they didn't grow up with and then there was one that was so sad to me and why i i don't know for me it just felt really real and maybe these are based off real stories but it was about two black women who grew up together grew up in the church so of course they were taught you know you're gonna get married to a man you save your um you save your purity for your husband then you have children and that's what you're meant to do and they are single for a really long time and they end up they have a really close friendship that crosses the friendship lines into something else very physical and one friend is you know realizing what this is and what it could be and the other friend is just kind of ignoring it and you know pretending that it doesn't count and that it doesn't count as sex so she's still this pure virgin still waiting for her perfect man her godly man to come along even in her 30s and you know not acknowledging the relationship because that's not she's still in that mentality of, of what she learned in the church and that one was so heartbreaking to me so it's just an interesting little short book of short stories um that i i feel like these have to be based on real stories but yeah i don't know i think it's worth the read i gave it four stars it was really good oh i don't know why my old ass decided to sit on the floor it was a good idea so then i read the radium girls the dark story of america's shining women by kate moore i heard about this book a few years ago from books with emily fox for some reason i thought this was about women working in the uk but it's about america and so i'm gonna blame it on being sick but really it's because i have a terrible memory um i can't remember when this started but essentially after the discover of radium the little thing that makes stuff glow in the dark and they were making all these like watches i'm like doing this as if you can see my arm and uh this is i think it started before world war ii world war ii but i don't know if it started before world war run but it started during a war time and so a lot of women were working these jobs because of course a lot of men are at war and so that's great it's bringing jobs to the communities they're getting paid decently well um but the thing about the watches is the faces are pretty small and so they're using these different methods and it's you know they're kind of trying to fine tune it in the beginning to figure out like kind of the best method to paint the watches um that's gonna provide 
like a quality product, but also not take super long. And so anyway, they figure out the best way to, you know, basically manipulate the product is to lip or take the brush, lick it, dip it into the material and then paint it on the thing and then repeat. And so of course, over time, they're getting all this radium in their mouths, but also this is at the beginning of radium discovery. So they didn't know a lot about it and it's a long time ago. It's the beginning of the 20th century. And so they're like, radium's just great. And so it's just all over their workstation. So it's in their mouths, it's on their hands, on their clothes. They would eat lunch at the same place that they were working. So it's just in everything. They're breathing it in all day. They take it home. She describes in the book how they go home and like hang up, you know, take off their clothes. Or if they went into a room, it was dark, like they're glowing. And so obviously with a modern mind and reading this, you're like, "Uh oh, this isn't good. And I knew from Emily Fox that there was it was going to get into some details. So warning, if you are interested in this book, that the author definitely describes the great pains, the suffering, the injury that the women go through, and so, whew, it can be a lot. So after a while, um, you know, some women are having various problems like tooth pain, jaw pain, um, starting to lose teeth and it just gets worse over time and so of course you start out with the first few women and, and they're not sure what's going on um at the time and like they've gone to the dentist warning about what i'm about to say and like one late like parts of their jaw just would like come apart like it was deteriorating their bone um a lot of the, some of them like their limbs were becoming shorter, their legs would break, they would have to be in these full body casts, like it sounded awful, it sounded truly terrible, but then as time goes on, and they're seeing more and more of these cases, and they find a way to test, and they figure out that it is connected to radium, then she starts explaining more how these women were trying to, you know, get some compensation, or at least get medical bills, um, covered by the company and of course <laughs> tale as old as time it's america so they're like <laughs> no it's not us and uh as more time goes on and, and more women are realizing what's happening to them and some of them kind of band together for like a kind of a class action lawsuit and how the corporation of course is going to do anything they can to deny they buy out doctors and lawyers to lie for them and so rage i was it was oh my god heartbreaking because they were struggling like these women had children you know they had they're taking care of their families and a lot of them were still working like the one lady it was like her one leg was four inches shorter than the other one because it had deteriorated deteriorated she had a broken leg and she was still walking to work and then she finally went to the doctor and they're like your leg is broken what <laughs> what it's worth the read just be just be ready for being uncomfortable and being angry because i just would be holding my jaw i was like oh my god i just can't imagine it's some of them like some of them died you know maybe in a couple of months some in a couple of years some lived way longer um and so of course the, the corporation tried to use that to their advantage like you know everyone's not just dropping dead just really terrible and so there's that <laughs> i don't know what else to say except especially when they when she would just oh <laughs> especially when she would describe them kind of like their last days i was just like i would just want to be and kill me like put out of my misery i can't imagine i mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. so that was a good book i gave it five stars <laughs> then i read will my cat eat my eyeballs and other questions about dead bodies by caitlin dowdy so i've read caitlin's other books um caitlin dowdy if you don't know she's pretty popular she's a youtube channel she's now a mortician um she started out uh, working at a crematory or crematorium is there a difference in California 
Um, and that was her first book kind of memoir, um, smoke gets in your eyes and i was like fascinated and then i read her other book which i can't think of the the title and then i read this one and so this one is basically a collection of questions but from kids because she said that you know people always have questions about death and funerals and stuff but kids are just very straight to the point like they don't they don't sugarcoat it so of course will my cat eat my eyeballs is one of the questions but there's other questions she answers like what happens if someone dies on a plane and just all of these other questions about dying and body preservation, funerals. Um, but I really like Caitlin Dowdy's work. And like, did I already say she has a YouTube channel and she really talks about the messed up funeral industry we have in America. And she's also traveled and um, interviewed other cultures and people around the world about their uh, death and funeral practices. So it's very interesting because she says that one thing, you know, she works towards is helping people I don't know, kind of get more comfortable with death because we're all going to die, um, become more understanding of it. So maybe we have less fear, which I'm terrified of dying. But yeah, I really like Caitlin Dowdy's work. And so if you're interested, if you don't know much maybe about the funeral industry in America, um, about death in general, I think her work is really a accessible she narrates all of her audiobooks they're really great to listen to it's not like super dense or heavy she's funny and she has a lot of youtube videos on different topics so it was really fun um so i gave that one four stars then i read hood feminism notes from the woman women that a movement forgot by mickey kendall this was for my book commuter read book club we had our live show last weekend um i will link that that was a great discussion i mean i didn't talk as much because my voice but the other ladies that were there um i was enjoying listening to their discussion so if you want to watch that replay i'll have that linked for you so uh not to spend a lot of time on it since we did have that discussion, but I gave it three stars, I think, because it's not my first book about feminism or any kind of anti-racism text that it wasn't wholly new to me. It wasn't like I got a lot out of it. I mostly enjoyed like her personal experiences and stories um, and kind of pinpointing some things that maybe I hadn't in my mind framed or considered to fall under the feminist umbrella and I was like oh, okay that makes sense and so those were a couple of things I gained but overall it was it's a really good entry-level book um very I hate using surface level it sounds like an insult but it's just very accessible it's short um it's very digestible especially if you like her voice um she narrates the audiobook uh so it's a good place to start. But if you have been reading any kind of other feminist text or any other anti-racist text, I don't know you'd get a lot from it. So that's how I feel about it. And lastly, I read Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Y. Davis. So this is about, pol not police, uh, prison abolition. So I, and I could be wrong, if you've read this book, please let me know your thoughts. So, I gave this four stars. Um, I feel like with prison abolition, there's like two main questions. And they're why and how. And for me, I'm, I don't need the why answered. Like, I already know why. And maybe that's because I am black. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I've watched a lot of prison documentaries i know how many people are wrongfully imprisoned or the sentencing is you know disproportionate depending on who they are how many people are in prison for nonviolent crimes uh, so many drug charges a lot of mental health issues like i already know why we d we should abolish pris prisons my biggest question is how and like, what do we do after that? Especially because I'm always like, I'm prison for prison abolition until somebody does something really dirty. And then I'm like, but I want you beneath the jail. So what do we do with those people? My biggest question, like, how do we deal with them? How do we deal with, I guess, law and order after if we don't have prisons? So I feel like our prisons obsolete focuses more on the why which is important 
but wasn't necessarily what I needed, but I still got stuff out of it. Does that make sense? So of course you should read it. I mean, it's short, um, but she shares a lot of, of course, statistics. And of course, what do we know that prisons are disproportionately filled with black and brown people, especially black and brown men. They have higher um, or longer sentences. Um, they're more wrongfully accused. And this is, of course, not to say that there are not a lot of white folks in prison, that white people are wrongfully accused. They are just saying disproportionately to the population of people in America, and then you look at the populations of the prisons, the math ain't math in, um, just the terrible conditions they're in, um, the free or very, very cheaply paid labor that uh, they do for a lot of industries in our country. Um, I knew that private prisons existed and made profits and in my mind, I just couldn't figure out how. And I didn't realize that for-profit prisons charge per inmate and they get that money from the government. Huh? Like, I am... Uh, I just... I, um, it's disgusting and then she of course talks about like the prison industrial complex because um and like the school to prison pipeline because we're not investing enough in a lot of communities and so their schools don't have uh these kids are already at a disadvantage and then they're more likely to go to prisons and then how a lot of other countries are starting to follow america's carceral carceral patterns and it's it's, it's 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 upsetting uh one statistic and just don't quote me because this isn't exactly but and this is an older text it was published in 2003 but it was like america's population or the united states population is like maybe five percent of the world's population again these are not correct numbers but our incarcerated population is like 25 percent of the world's population again the numbers why so Definitely read it if you have questions as to why. Why are prisons obsolete? Like, why should we not have them? But, and she does touch on the how a little bit. Um, obviously, we need more money and more mental health institutions. I think she said that there's way more people in who have mental health issues in prisons than in mental health institutions. And I believe that because a lot of them are underfunded or not funded. And so they've closed. And that's a lot of people who have mental health crises and end up in a prison like that's going to help them. A lot of people with drug addictions like that's going to help them. Um, so we need more of that. And of course, more essentially <clears throat> Everything that our government, and I'm not even going to just say that the Republicans don't want to invest in because both parties are trash. I just think the Republicans are more trash than the Democrats. So both parties, like I said, are trash. So things they don't want to invest in, like, um, I don't know, living, thriving wages for people affordable health care affordable daycare quality education um schools that all have equal funding um clean and safe classrooms that are warm or cool um good textbooks a, a well-rounded curriculum safe parks clean water food you know, safe, affordable food, all those things that, you know, people need to survive and thrive. Those, those are like a foundation, but our government's like, <laughs> military budget, <laughs> food, water. <laughs> we need more things that go pew pew, <laughs> vroom vroom, you know what I'm saying? What do y'all need? Books. <laughs> 
what you want to make more than 750 an hour get out of here <laughs> crazy <sighs> all of that uh would be a big that would be a big part um and then i know she gave an example of like these men who committed a murder in south africa and they think they did serve some time but then were forgiven by the family and who got out and were able to you know turn their lives around and so i need i need more i need more on the what we gonna do with them scumbags you know like the the rapist the pedos the murderers like the intentional you know like i'm hunting you down not i killed in self-defense like i have a question about those people but anyway this is a obviously i think a good start to a uh, reading on prison abolition and i uh need to find more on this topic but <sighs> i mean would it be me if i didn't read nonfiction that infuriated me no i wouldn't no, it wouldn't. So that was my reading month. It was not terrible, but it was not amazing. And I am testing different books to see if I'm ready to, you know, if if my mind will let me out of my slump. Uh, it's we're still not there yet. So that was that. Um, did you read any of these books let me know your thoughts or tell me how your reading month went do you have any specific reading plans for april i do not and um i think that's it you know i hope you're taking care of yourselves because <clears throat> as a queen once said earth is ghetto i want to leave can you be me up I'm out on the street at a corner store, you know the one on 15th, got a bright shirt on so I'm easy to see, I've been down here stranded indefinitely, <laughs> do y'all not remember that song? <laughs> it's a pop, but truly, earth is ghetto, I wanna leave, um, mm, yes, so I've, uh, home with my psychiatrist today and i want to be like uh yeah can we dial up the meds fam I'm tired of feeling <laughs> i want to be numb homie <laughs> but really though um so anyway as y'all should know by now if you're struggling i'm struggling with you boo i'm right here with you my content whack <laughs> my my mental whack my reading whack it's a time so anywho i will wrap this up hopefully i have sound when i go to edit this video i hope you're all blessed hydrated moisturized and sunscreened and i will see you in my next one bye <laughs>